Hey, happy Friday. This week, Intel's high-end chips seem to be crashing and burning. Biden and Trump both somehow want to escalate the trade wars. And your favorite big tech company probably trained their AI on stolen videos from YouTube, including from me. Welcome to the Friday Checkout. I absolutely hate this future. This video was sponsored by Incogni. Okay, for my first story of the week, Intel delivered one of the most spectacular failures of the last couple of years. Specifically, high-end versions of the company's newest generation chips called Raptor Lake, used in servers, development systems, and desktop PCs, continued to face issues. And here's a timeline. Starting as early as February, people first reported some video games crashing on their new PCs, including with games like Fortnite and Tekken. The error messages originally blamed the video memory errors, leading to gamers initially blaming everyone but Intel for the issues, but pretty quickly Nvidia let everyone know that the crashes are actually Intel's fault. First gamers and then motherboard makers realized that the quote-unquote fix was just to underclock and undervolt their systems, but that of course caused clear performance downgrades. But then even worse, this week first the game publisher Warframe pointed out that almost all of its game crashes came from the affected chips, while another publisher called Alderon said that Intel's chips were defective because they had a nearly 100% crash rate on their games and caused constant crashes on their game servers too. And if that wasn't bad enough, YouTuber Level 1 Techs then also dug through the data and found that these chips were massively more prone to stability issues than all others. So that's pretty terrible, and to make things even worse, Intel still doesn't seem to know what is actually causing these issues and whether or not we can expect a fix soon. So, yikes. Okay, and if you thought that Intel wasn't a bad spot, well, my second story of the week is that almost all other chip makers are in trouble as well because of the chip wars actually heating up. First, Donald Trump in an interview with Bloomberg demanded that Taiwan pay the US for its defense and then also said that, quote, Taiwan took our chip business from us. I mean, how stupid are we? They took all of our chip business. They are immensely wealthy and I don't think we are any different from an insurance policy. Why? Why are we doing this? We should have never let that happen. And if you aren't familiar with the chip industry, he is, of course, referring to the fact that Taiwan's TSMC is the most successful chip manufacturer by far after its American competitors did a really poor job and the Taiwanese giant is now producing over 90% of the world's advanced chips. And if Trump is not going to defend Taiwan in a case of a Chinese attack, then things would get really weird. Letting China take Taiwan, including TSMC, would be a borderline catastrophic event for the entire American economy, except maybe for Intel, which is the only major American company hanging on by a thread with its own fabs, so I'm not exactly sure what Trump is thinking. But if that wasn't enough, the chip wars then heated up even more. Because it turns out that the current US government also wants to place even tougher trade restrictions on China's chip industry, according to Bloomberg. Their new a new rule called the Foreign Direct Product Rule aims to impose US controls even if a company only uses the tiniest amount of American technology. So for example, the Dutch chip equipment company ASML has so far been able to supply their older DUV machines but not their newer EUV ones, but going forward the company might not be able to supply either, and similar restrictions are expected by Tokyo Electron and other suppliers too. Stocks across the industry have fallen and even American firms like LAM are like, yo, chill bro, take a software approach. But neither Biden nor Trump seem to want to chill, so things are escalating even further, it seems. Okay, and for my third story of the week, a new report by Proof News says that a lot of YouTube videos were used to train AI by a ton of tech giants, including Apple, Nvidia, Anthropic, and more, of course, all without consent. Specifically, subtitles from more than 170,000 YouTube videos were found in a gigantic dataset called The Pile, which the company used for training. This includes subtitles from two of my own videos, apparently, but also loads of videos from others like Marcus Brownlee, and the dataset was put together by Eleuther AI, which calls itself a non-profit AI lab. Of course, this is not only what we in the industry like to call a certified dick move, it is also very questionable in terms of copyright and in terms of YouTube's terms of service. But here's the fun news. Anthropic, one of the big players, says that they did use the pile, but they did not directly violate YouTube's terms of service because they didn't scrape the data themselves. It's the pile's authors who did the scraping, so if anyone is guilty, it must be them. Hmm, having a random nonprofit do all the scraping seems awfully convenient given this stance. <laughs> 
And Apple was also quick to let you know that while they did also use the Pile to train their so-called Open ELM model, that model totally does not power their upcoming Apple intelligence system, so please don't be angry with them at all. Don't you love it when tech giants are literally taking your stuff without your consent to build systems that will potentially replace you in the future and then will even go and charge people money for that? The future is looking great. Oh well, now on to the brief, I guess. iOS 18's public beta opened up this week, and most excitingly, iPhones now kind of support RCS. That's the fancy chat standard to replace SMS if you're wondering, and the bubbles are still green, plus there's no encryption yet, but you do get high quality images, voice files, and more. Then, in kind of silly news this week, Tinder will now help people find their most attractive photos on the dating app to make their profiles even more curated, I guess. And meanwhile, over at Meta, reality has finally come to Meta's Reality Labs. Reality Labs is responsible for VR and AR at Meta, and the company has asked this unit to cut its spending by 20% in the coming years, even as two Quest 4 versions are expected in 2026, and also a Quest Pro 2 in 2027. Also, the company behind the Ray-Bans brand has apparently said no to Meta using them for their next smart glasses, as those frames might end up being a bit unusually bulky. The next generation is supposed to have screens inside, I guess that would make the glasses less fashionable, and so Ray-Ban said no because fashion. And then moving on to our release monitor, Dyson has just announced their new headphones, and this time the weird face air purifier mask thing is gone. At $500, these are somehow even more expensive than Apple's AirPods Maxes right now. But at least my studio mate Killian says that they actually sound great and the noise cancelling is very good too. They offer 55 hours of battery life and also a huge amount of customization with many plates, plus even an insanely thin speaker design because the battery is apparently in the headband. Pretty quirky. And next, HMD, the company behind the Nokia phone revival, has released its self-branded phone called the HMD Skyline. It's a $500 mid-range model, with the biggest deal being that it is the first Android phone with Qi 2 wireless charging. That means MagSafe is basically here for Android. Nice! Then, in unexpected third-party accessory news, the $80 TinyPod was launched as a gizmo that turns the Apple Watch into an iPod with a functioning click wheel. I can't decide if this is genius or dumb or both, because I guess all it does is just turn the crown, but okay. And moving on, if you're hearing this segment, it means that Xiaomi will have launched a whole bunch of new products right as we're wrapping up this video. I'm recording this in the past, so I'll tell you what I think they'll be launching by the time you're watching, and if there's anything that I'm wrong about, I'll add some corrections. <laughs> So there should be two new foldables, including the Xiaomi Mix Fold 4 and the Xiaomi Mix Flip, which is Xiaomi's first clamshell phone. Then there's supposedly a Redmi K70 Ultra, a Xiaomi Smart Band 9, and also the Xiaomi Buds 5, plus, most interesting to me, the Xiaomi Watch S4 Sport. We know that the Watch S4 Sport is made in collaboration with Sunto, the Finnish competitor to Garmin, who is specialized in outdoor watches and stuff, and I honestly don't really understand why European companies are so keen to sell their brands and their know-how to potentially even competitors. But oh well. Now, recently, you might have also heard that first the computer brand Zotec, and and then MSI exposed sensitive user data from hundreds of thousands of customers in just the last two weeks. Data leaks like these are incredibly common, and they are a big reason for why you're getting so many spam calls and emails that are often even surprisingly personalized. So-called data brokers collect stuff like your actual address, your phone number, your payment history, and more from breaches like these, and they combine them to build profiles of you that they sell to everyone from scammers to government agencies. This is really creepy, but if you don't like it, Incogni is here to help. As it turns out, in many countries, you can actually request your data to be deleted, and there are actual laws that require companies to comply. But here's the problem. How do you know who has your data? How do you contact all of them? And how do you stop them from making a new profile of you right after they deleted your old one? Well, you do all of that with Incogni, which actually does the job of automatically reaching out to data brokers on your behalf to request removal of your personal data based on applicable laws in various markets, and then deals with any objections from their side. You can see that they have already removed me from 57 seven different data brokers, and they continually keep doing this to stop you from re-entering the databases right after, hence why this is a subscription. For you, the process is automatic, and they've also just started allowing you to remove multiple emails and up to three different physical addresses with a single subscription, plus they now also have family plans. Note that removals are only legally binding in these places because in other jurisdictions their data laws might be lacking, but that's a pretty good start already. And to sign up, be sure to use my code FRIDAYCHECKOUT to get 60% off an annual Incogni plan. That is incogni.com slash Friday checkout for 60% off, and I'll see you next Friday.